Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Jesse Dame, and I'll be moderate, moderating uh, the session as well as taking part in the presentation. So we'll be moving around a little bit. Um, we're actually uh, all joined here today. Um, so to start off uh, with a reminder, all Summit uh, 2020 participants must respect and abide by the community guidelines uh, you agree to when registering for the conference. If you need to read them again, they are available at the Summit 2020 webpage at cdrc.net backslash summit underscore 2020. <laughs> uh, also, uh, ever, um, if ever uh, a conversation topic makes you feel anxious or distressed, uh, there is a team of counselors ready to provide an active listening uh, to write active listening through uh, the participatory directory. You can spot the counselors by uh, looking for display pictures with the, the, the letter C. So I am joined today uh, with both Harlan Pruden and uh, Dr. Travis Solway. Um, Harlan is uh, one of my amazing mentors um, and uh, lucky to call a friend. He uh, is First Nations Cree and works with and for the Two-Spirit community locally, nationally, and internationally. Currently, Harlan is an educator at Chimamuk, and, um, an Indigenous public health program at BCCDC, and is also a co-founder of the Two-Spirit Dry Lab, uh, North America's first research group, Fosh Lab, that exclusively focuses on Two-Spirit peoples, uh, communities, and or experiences. And then we have Travis Solway, who is our social uh, epidemiologist, sorry, whose research uh, investigates population health inequities in the context of stigma. He is an associate professor at SFU, Faculty of Health Sciences, and has 18 years of experience working in the lesbian, two-spirit, bisexual, queer, uh, and gay communities to inform public health in interventions. He is the co-founder uh, with Harlan of the Two-Spirit Draw Lab and the co-founder and facilitator of the Roundtable's Feces LGBTQ2S Mental Health and um, Substance Use Network Space. So welcome you both. Thank you for that. Yay. And I just want to jump in here real quickly because I want to introduce Jesse. Um, one, as um, Jesse is the newest member to the Two Spirit Dry Lab, he uh, joined us this week. So we're like so excited to have another member of our scrappy lab. Um, Jesse Dame is a proud Two Spirit Metis registered nurse with a background in perinatal with rural remote and STBBI. Uh, certificate, certified nurse. Jesse works um, with the Two-Spirit people and Indigenous communities to create new resources and to connect communities to existing resources available to gay, bi, and other men who have sex with men or GBMSM. And uh, Jesse is also the Two-Spirit uh, program manager at our fave organization, CBRC. Jesse uh, will be uh, supporting health promotion in Indigenous communities. We'll focus on Two-Spirit people, which I'm so incredibly happy that he does that work. And a major project in his portfolio is the creation of a new at-home um, HIV testing project for Two-Spirit and GBMSM GB and queer Indigenous men, which is currently in the consultation phase, but yesterday, Health Canada just made the announcement that we have this approved intervention. And so now we can actually start releasing and talking about what does that program look like and this incredible resource for at-home um, STI testing. So lots, lots more to come, especially from Harlan and I and Travis. Um, so Travis will start us off with uh, a territorial land acknowledgement. Thank you for those intros, Jesse and Harlan. Um, so uh, I'm uh, really excited for this session and excited to be with, with the two of you. Uh, I'm an analytical person, so uh, I kind of approach the land acknowledgement um, in, in two parts to me. The first part, of course, is about the land. And here uh, we are on um, Musqueam and Squamish and tsleil lands, uh, lands that have been stewarded by these nations and Coast Salish people for, for centuries, for millennia. And um, the land part for me, the, 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 the Tsleil-Waut and Tsleil-Waututh refers to the Burrard Inlet. I live a few blocks from the Burrard Inlet and when I walk there, uh, what I see is, um, for those of you who are not uh, in or have not visited Vancouver, um, it's a very busy port uh, full of freighters carrying cargo and oil um, and all kinds of goods. Uh, and, and um, uh, you know, when I look at that, I think about one of the themes of the summit, responsibility. What is my role to the land? How are we taking care of the land and how are we learning from um, what these indigenous uh, peoples have, have uh, done to take care of the land over the last few centuries? Um, but it's also about people. And we're here today to talk about the Two-Spirit Dry Lab. Um, and for me, the, the experience in the Two-Spirit Dry Lab over the last few years has been really an exercise in humility. 
um, as a descendant of European settlers um, who um, have lived on Turtle Island for a very long time, I have to think about, reflect deeply about the harms that my people have, uh, have done uh, in exacting their white privilege. Um, and I think a lot in the Two-Spirit Dry Lab about how do I build better relations with Indigenous peoples and acknowledging that this happens very slowly, uh, deliberately, and with a lot of humility, um, but it, it's doable. And that's, that's the story that we're here to share today, how this lab um, has kind of uh, started to move toward relationships of reconciliation in a Two-Spirit context. Carla. Nope, Jesse. No, yes. Jesse. <laughs> uh, thank you so much Charles, for that opening. Um, so for today, we will um, be going over an overview of what and who is Two-Spirit, the how, who, and what of the Two-Spirit Dry Lab. Um, we will speak to, um, Travis and uh, Harlan will speak to the Meet the Methods fact sheet, which is a new fact sheet that uh, they both just co-created, um, collecting, collecting Two-Spirit data. And then depending on time, we will get into some questions at the end. Um, because I'm moderating as well as taking part, I will try to keep up uh, in the chat, but primarily save the questions for the end if possible. So Harlan, over to you. So I'm going to be talking really, really fast because I want to get to the actual research and the meat of like, how do we collect data in a culturally uh, sensitive and affirming way for our two-spirit relatives? So first of all, this slide is the closest slide that you're going to get to a definition of what and who two-spirit is. First of all, two-spirit, it's a concept, not an identity, and it's not really a term. Uh, and what I mean by that is Two-Spirit is a, is a community organizing strategy or tool. Uh, it's a way to identify those individuals who are indigenous to Turtle Island and are on somewhere on the gender and or the sexual orientation spectrum, or what we would know at, within a Western framework who are LGBTQI+. Two-Spirit doesn't make sense unless it's contextualized within an indigenous community or framework, um, and that we will get into the terms later. Uh, within a traditional setting, Two-Spirit was a gender analysis as opposed to a sexual orientation analysis, meaning that um, my, for my Cree folks, I wouldn't be known as a man, Napueo, nor would I be known as a woman, Esquia. I'd be known as an Ayakwe, being um, I am Two-Spirit, another gender. So some nations only had two genders, while other nations had three, four, five, six, some nations had seven different genders. How do we conceive of a world that has more than two genders or that gender binary? Today, most people associate the term with LGBTQ plus, I plus native people. However, the work of organizations, leaders, elders, and community members is a more akin to this traditional understanding of who were we within a pre-contact setting and what is the relevancy of that information and in teachings today. Uh, a little bit of the history of those terms. Uh, where did Two-Spirit come from? So prior to contact and even up after contact, the term uh, for those nations that had a Two-Spirit tradition, we had our own words within our own languages that named, accounted, and identified our Two-Spirit relatives. A little after um, uh, when we were discovered <laughs> in October 10th, the way that I like to tell myself the story is, is that the indigenous people of the land that we would refer to as Hispaniola, they woke up and they discovered CC on their shores. I think that is a more truer account of that whole discovery doctrine. But a little after first, uh, first contact, uh, French missionaries who were wandering around Turtle Island found these individuals who were like maybe male assigned and were doing the work of women or female assigned and were doing the work of men. And they were like, we don't know how to contextualize this. And so there was this Persian word parja that was spread throughout Europe. It first showed up in Italian, bardasso, then Spanish, mardaxa. And then in the early 15th century, um, it showed up in French as berdash. Um, and so Burdash was used. Um, it literally translates into a young man or boy who serves as another succubus. Y'all have to Google that word because it's a crazy A word. Um, and, um, or uh, a passive homosexual partner, i.e. a bottom. Um, and so that word was used for many, many years, but starting in 1989, there was a little bit of consciousness and then it at the, culminated at the 1990 Two-Spirit Gathering, well, the Basket and Bow Gathering, where the council, or the, uh, all of the attendees came together and they gathered a grand council and they were like, we hate this word, we reject it. One, it's base, two, it only talks about sex. 
Um, and so what they landed on was the term two-spirit. They wanted a term that reflected the combination of both masculinity and femininity, which attributed to males in feminine roles and females in masculine roles. And there we get a pivot. A pivot was to your role within society, i.e. gender, as opposed to sexual orientation. Also important to, to note is, is that it was an ultimate act of sovereignty, sovereignty of body and sovereignty of land. They were saying, you members of the academy, you members of like the missionary and or the churches, you have no right to name us. That right belongs to us. And so it was an ultimate expression of self-determination or sovereignty of body and sovereignty of land. So it's a deeply political term also. And I think that we must pause um, and acknowledge that, that, that political sovereignty. Um, so just if we're talking about gender, um, and I just want to give you a little taste. Like, I'm not going to go through this entire list. I'm only going to talk about the Cree example. So traditionally, for us Crees, we had two big dominant camps or two big dominant societies. We had our men's camp. They all hunted. We had our women's camp. They all gathered. The way that us Crees also worked is that a woman was never allowed in a man's camp and a man was never allowed in a woman's camp. So if there was ever imbalance or disharmony, a woman couldn't walk over to the man's camp and say, hey, men, what's going on? And a man couldn't walk over to the woman's camp. But us as a Yaque, um, we had access and unfettered and equal access to both camps. And so if there was ever imbalance or disharmony, we could walk over to the men's camp and we're like, hey, men, what's going on? Walk over to the women's camp. Hey, women, what's going on? And we can go back and forth and we can mediate conflict and or to negotiate resolution between these two camps. A man couldn't do this, a woman couldn't do this, just us as a Yahweh. And so that was our role and that was our function. So our men hunted their role, our women gathered their role, our role was to mediate. And it was no more valued than our men hunting or our women gathering, it was just a different role within society. So that's that gender analysis. Next slide. I've collected about 130 terms within our own languages. You'll see some um, lists uh, bolded, and those are new lists uh, and new words that I'm constantly adding to this. There are omissions, errors, and flat out wrong information in this database. And you're like, why are you getting out misinformation? Is um, It would take probably a lifetime, heck, it could take about two lifetimes to clean this database up and to go through a, a multi-validation process. Next slide is, um, and in that time, in that intervening lifetimes, more of these teachings and more of this knowledge will be lost. So if you see your, no, your, your nation, by all means, uh, validate it and update it. And if you don't see your nation, I ask you to talk and work with some of your knowledge keepers to see if you can find your language for your own word for your two-spirit relatives. One more. And so these words are so incredibly powerful because where there's a word, there's a story. Where there's a word, there's a people. But more importantly, where there's a word, there's a history. And so these words are so incredibly powerful in that, you know, when we say, hey, Two-Spirit community, we're doing a powwow. If someone answers that call and they show up and they're male assigned and maybe Zuni, we gift them their word lachamana and a framework to try to make sense of Lahamana. And then the magic and or the medicine happens and the transformation is that these individuals are then gifted and they begin the inquiry and they begin the conversation of what does it mean to be Lahamana? Who is Lahamana? And what is my role and purpose as a Lahamana for my Zuni people? It has to be contextualized within their nation, this nation specific. And it calls them and centers their ingenuity. Where prior to these words, often our LGBT and queer indigenous people think that they have to make a choice between being LGBT and being Zuni or being an Indian. And what do they often do? Without these words and these teachings, they run off and they go to an urban setting where they join the LGBT queer community at the expense of their own identity, or they're run and traced out of their community so they seek security and safety within the LGBT community, only to be gifted these words that calls them back home and is affirming of who they are within the broadest universal set. We're not alone. If you look at other indigenous communities across the world, 
Um, they too have a very similar sort of gender analysis, although they wouldn't use the term two-spirit. Uh, so you have the Mahu in Hawaii, the Fafafane in Samoa, the Bulbul or the Hidra in India and Pakistan. And the list, this list is also completely in, um, not complete, uh, but there is this multiple um, non-binary gender and gender analysis that goes into these concepts. Um, if you would like more information, uh, go to the two-spiritjournal.com, uh, two use the little search engine, write up resources, and there's like an hour, hour and a half lecture that delves into this conversation even more. Uh, so in uh, a quick summary, so two-spirit is the intersection of those are the, the intersection of those who embody diverse sexualities, gender, gender roles, and gender expression, and who are indigenous to Turtle Island. Um, we are a community organization, or that identity is a community organization tool, not an identity. Sorry, I just misspoke. <laughs> um, it is going to mean something different depending on what nation uh, an individual is from, uh, an, an individual is from, and a member of. The Two-Spirit refers to a historical and traditional um, concept that predicts Western notions uh, and is related to or associated, can be associated with to the LGBTQI+. Um, and it is about reclaiming and restoring a place of honor, respect, and dignity within an individual's nation. This work is deep decolonizing work and centers on indigeneity that calls two-spirit peoples home and is thereby a mending of the sacred hoop. Cool. Mm -hmm. So what I would like to do right now is I wanted to rush through that who and what is two-spirit. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to talk a little bit slower because this is the actual work. So Travis, do not be a motor mouth Mabel. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, um, thank you, Harlan, for that really excellent grounding. Um, every time I hear Harlan share some of the, the who and what and how of Two Spirit, uh, I, I take something new from it. Um, and um, kudos to you for doing all that work, pulling together those uh, nation-specific Two Spirit terms. Um, the Two-Spirit Dry Lab is uh, just getting started. We, we formed a few years ago, um, and it really started, uh, it was born out of a CBRC project, a Sex Now survey, which we'll talk about more in a moment. Um, we are uh, a group of Indigenous people and settlers. Uh, we come with a wide variety of disciplinary uh, interests and foci, including epidemiology, including sociology, um, including um, community-based practices. Um, how do we actually measure data better? And all with a, a, a two-eyed seeing lens. So how do we incorporate strengths of both indigenous uh, and Western ways of knowing? And we've included here photos of our fabulous team, our growing team. Uh, we're really grateful. Um, Aiden and Teddy and Jenny and Ryan uh, and Nathan are not here with us, but they're here with us in spirit and we're thankful to all of their contributions. Would you like me to, no, you're gonna talk about how we work or you'd like me to? No, you, uh, okay. well, we'll both. Mm -hmm. All right, mm -hmm. we, we have a lot to say. <laughs> Uh, so, as I said, uh, you know, two-eyed seeing, but really centering Indigenous ways of being. We work in a way um, that's really very collaborative and circular. So we sit down in a circle and ask everyone to bring their strengths, um, whether that is from an Indigenous perspective or from a Western perspective, regardless of methodology um, and training. Uh, we want to hear from everyone and we, we work very openly and in a non-linear fashion, which means sometimes we start analyzing the data a question comes up and we have to go back and ask, how do we do a better job of measuring this? Um, Harlan, you wanna add a bit about- uh, And I think that right? it's also, you know, for those work and why the, at the beginning you saw the how, is, is that for the Two-Spirit Dry Lab, there's really attentiveness of how does the work happen? How do we show up? And I would like to, like I know that we work in a circle, meaning every voice is heard and it's non-hierarchical. So there are no leads, we collectively lead. And so there's that, but there's also this, um, and I know that when we first met, we did ceremony, we did tobacco bundles. And there was this like this real attentiveness and this commitment by all of the members to honor the sacred space that dwells between all of us and within between all of us. So in and between all of us, and where we're honoring each other's um, humanity and we actually call their humanity to the table and to this work. 
And so that's where it gets really messy. And so it's not like most people, when they think of labs, they, they talk about the work or the outcomes of what we want to do. That's important. But for us within the Two-Spirit Drab is Two-Spirit Dry Lab is the more how are we gathering as a research group, a community of practice. And then it is what is our relationship together as a unit, as one. And I think that once you get that in place, wherever you go, the what or the work will be good work because it is being mindful and respectful of everyone. And so it's like that really that attentiveness of the how, the what will take care of itself, but more importantly is the how. And so that I think is unique to that, but it makes it really messy and, uh, and beautiful at the same time. And so I just like honored to have like, such an amazing community. Is it me? Oh, it's Jesse. <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh, so a quick summary, just um, so sex now, uh, often referred to as the gay census, sorry, um, is Canada's largest and longest running national uh, periodic survey um, of GBT2Q men's health um, run by the Community Research Center. So as you can see, um, the Sex Now survey has gone from uh, a paper-based provincial questionnaire filled out at Pride events uh, to a national survey administered both online and in person in French and in English. Um, the 2014-2015 the cycle uh, captured over 8,000 respondents. Um, from a health equity perspective, Sex Now addresses the lack of national data on the health of GBT2Q men and has more recently been expanded to capture two-spirit individuals. Thanks, Jesse. So um, as Jesse mentioned in 2014, which was an online cycle of Sex Now, um, and, and I know several of you who are in the audience um, contributed to this work, so thank you for that. Uh, we were really pleased to have uh, such a large sample. And as many of you know, um, the goal uh, from an equity framework with these surveys is to get a large enough uh, sample of intersecting identities that we can actually say something meaningful about, for instance, uh, Indigenous uh, Two-Spirit people. Um, so uh, very well-meaning in 2014, we included Two-Spirit um, as a gender identity category and as a sexual orientation category alongside some of the Western identities that might be familiar to you. Um, as you probably know, in much of uh, health research, inclusive of the Sex Now survey, um, it's a process of iterating through different, um, different uh, attempts. Uh, to do better job with measurement um, and this is where we were at in 2014. Uh, you can go on yeah and you can go on again <laughs> and again <laughs> uh, and then you can see also the ethnic cultural uh, question where we include um, uh, uh, aboriginal in, in this case without distinguishing between first nations inuit and metis um, one more click, I think, Jesse. Yeah, so um, it, we were pleased with the results. Four and a half percent of the respondents identified as Aboriginal. Um, and this is, uh, you know, roughly on par with the proportionate distribution of uh, Aboriginal people in Canada. Um, but we, we ran into a problem very quickly. Um, and this is a problem not unique to this survey. Uh, when uh, we first came together as a Two-Spirit Dry Lab, we identified a lot of surveys uh, around Canada. Um, that were using a very similar approach. And what we found was, oh, 156 respondents are two-spirit, fantastic. The problem is the, the majority of these were not Aboriginal. By including the two-spirit uh, as an identity option under gender or sexuality, uh, we were erasing a lot of really important meaning uh, the the, the uh, indigenous specific meanings to two spirit that Harlan talked about earlier today. Um, and we had a lot of people that we didn't know what to do with their data. We didn't know how to interpret what do they mean if they're not indigenous and they're selecting two spirit. So we got together as a lab. Uh, we worked with uh, folks at the CBRC and sex now. Um, and uh, this is the second part of our story. So the second part of the story is that we met with the uh, principal investigator, Nate, who is also another member of our lab. And um, what we found was from the 2014-2015 data set is that there were some missing data points. They were like, so how many people who are indigenous or Aboriginal at that time lived on a reservation? We couldn't answer that because we only asked for rural and remote and urban. We also said, how many people are engaged in the criminal justice system or have like touched with the criminal? We didn't ask that question. And things like how many people look at the supports of knowledge keepers or elders? Um, and again, we didn't ask that question. And so we prepared a full report, an oral report, 
uh, to Nate and we said, these are some of the things that we would like to see, some of the indicators or some of the questions within the 2018. And what we also did is we asked for the two-spirit question to be walled off so non-Indigenous people could not get the question and would not be able to use and opt into identifying as two-spirit or selecting. So what you'll see here is um, we, we tucked in two-spirit in the Indigenous um, or the racial and or the ethnic category. Uh, so someone who has to select Indigenous then what they had to do is to identify as uh, First Nations, Métis, Inuit, prefer to self-describe and or prefer not to say, and I think that's important. And also then and only then after answering those two questions, did they get the question is, are you two-spirit, yes or no? Uh, click the slide. And what we found from the 2018 survey sample that we had a, an impressive nine percent, roughly nine percent of the respondents of the 2018 in-person survey were Indigenous. About 60 percent were First Nations, about 40 percent were Métis, and about three percent were Inuk, which is really kind of cool. Uh, we only make up around five percent, so this is like a doubling of the sample size. Uh, so it's, this is incredible data. And about 42% of the Indigenous respondents said that they are two-spirit. Um, some people don't use the term two-spirit, right? Zero percent of the respondents were not Indigenous because we effectively walled it off for non-Indigenous people to opt into and using and claiming two-spirit as theirs. So the data is much more cleaner. And so we can now use this piece of information with a lot of the other indicators and questions to do a, a sex and gender based analysis that is two spirit mindful, two spirit inclusive, but two spirit distinct. And so it opens up these possibilities of doing this amazing research. Now I do wanna take a little pause because I think that some of the work that the Two Spirit Dry Lab um, and with Travis's leadership, as well as many of the other members is, is that we're also trying to challenge the way that science happens. In how many folks who are on this have read um, um, papers in which that they say, you know, primarily um, that there is a, a smaller sample size, like in our case, it would be indigenous. And we compare that to how non-indigenous or primarily white folks are doing. And you always see that there's always this comparison, right? But what we have done is when we structure our work like that and conversations like that, we're creating an inequity, an inequity that will never be overcome. Because try as I might, I'm never going to be white. So why does my community have to be compared to non-Indigenous people, white people? And so for the Two-Spirit Dry Lab, what we do is we take, in this case, we'll be taking the 2018 survey sample of the only the indigenous respondents, the 314, 9% of the survey sample, and we treat the, four, the 314 as a whole data set. Now what we can do is go in of like, how many of those 314 identify as two-spirit, 42%. Of those 42%, how many people are tapping into knowledge keepers? How many people are going to, uh, where are they getting their, their, their prep services? How are they accessing prep? Um, are they accessing, what's their relationship to substance use? Compared to those that don't use the term two-spirit, are there differences there? Are there differences between those that are, live on reservations as opposed to those that live in urban settings? How does two-spirit people like fall out within that? And what we're doing is we're making some intra-comparisons between the indigenous people to indigenous people, two-spirit people to two-spirit people, and we're no longer making these inequities in which that we're holding up white folks. Why this is so incredibly important is, is that when, and I've always been incredibly uncomfortable with this, with that, that comparison, is often the white folks are, you know, they're gonna have better health outcomes. So when we're reporting out the data to folks, we'll say, oh, native people, you're gonna die younger. You're gonna have more higher rates of HIV and syphilis and you're gonna have poor, like you're gonna be poor. And it makes us less than in that we're always trying to catch up. And so we're messaging that there's, you are less than. 
But if there is also a non-Indigenous or white person in the audience, what they are hearing is, I'm going to live longer. I'm not going to have HIV. I'm going to have better health, education, better income, better jobs. And what we're doing is, although we don't say that, we always say it's the opposite, is that um, we are passively and speaking into the void that is supportive of white supremacy. It can be argued that way. Native people, you're going to die younger. And at the same time, when we say that, implicitly we're saying, white people, you're going to live longer. Thereby, you must be better. Native people, you are worse off. White people, you're better off. And so we must challenge that because it is within that neutral way of that comparison of creating that inequity that we may be inadvertently supporting white supremacy and white supremacy attitudes. We must challenge that. And through the True Spirit Dry Lab and the work that we do, because we don't do that scholarship or that research. And as a result, we are really challenging um, those messages and how we do science. Thank you, Harlan. Um, so, uh, of course, um, I'm sure many of you have questions about what does this look like in my survey? How have I measured Two Spirit? What should be done next? And Harlan um, invited me very graciously um, through his work with the Institute of Gender and Health at CIHR to actually put this down on paper. Um, and the folks at IGH had asked, you know, how we get asked this question all the time, how do we do better? How do we more meaningfully include two-spirit people in health research? Uh, so Harlan and I uh, have worked with a lot of feedback, including from some of you, so thank you, um, to develop what we think is, um, and we humbly offer as uh, a starting point for people like myself who, um, you know, prior to my work with the Two-Spirit Dry Lab, was really scratching my head. What do I do um, with meaning to be inclusive of two-spirit people, but not knowing what it looks like in the methods? So this is a two-page um, info sheet uh, that is on the IGH website. Um, I imagine we can share it through the chat somewhere. Mm -hmm. Um, and it has uh, the example that Harlan just gave, uh, along with some uh, a, a breakdown of what this really looks like in terms of how do you approach the work, how you conceive of Two Spirit, and how do you implement it in uh, questionnaires that you are um, putting out um, today. Uh, so we encourage you to take a look at this uh, info sheet. Um, and uh, I think now we're going to have some reflections on the overall research process. Uh, I think, Jesse, you're going to talk a bit about mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so thank you, uh, Travis and Harlan. So I mean, that really, as uh, everyone on the call and as researchers, it really draws attention to how we report data, what we're saying, um, how we identify risk factors and what that means. Um, so really to analyze how we're reporting all data, who we're comparing to who. Because as we, as we know now, a single word or uh, um, labeling can uh, do years and years of harm. Um, so um, what we've done and uh, what we have clearly uh, been able to find out is that when we're collecting two-spirit data um, in a culturally safe and affirming way, um, health researchers are given the opportunity to promote rigorous science that considers biological sex and all genders. Um, research conducted in this way uh, has the potential to expand our understanding of health within a diverse, diversity framework that considers how determinants such as ethnicity, race, socioeconomic status, disability, sexual orientation, migration status, age, and geography interact with sex and or gender. By bringing these considerations into focus, they can help formulate health research policies and programs that are relevant to the diversity of the Canadian population. Um, so I think Harlan's gonna chat with me a little bit just about how important it is for relationship building when we are doing research and what that means. Sure. <laughs> um, so getting the research method and asking the question, I think is incredibly important. And I think if you wanna just like, that is your initial step, I think that is great. Although I would like to challenge you and I'm taking the model and the leadership around um, the community-based research centers work within the 2018 survey sample. So part of that story from the 2014 to 2018 was, um, meeting with Nate, providing feedback so that the uh, in, Indigenous and Two-Spirit people could see themselves within the research instrument. So having set questions around like utilization of elders, 
as well as uh, knowledge keepers. Do they go to ceremony? What does ceremony look like? So that is, that's the next step. Now that you have the question, it is, are all there other questions? Do you have like options for indigenous people to see themselves within the, in, within the survey instrument? That's the next step. The third step, a part of the story of the Two-Spirit Dry Lab is because Nate and his amazing allyship accepted all of our recommendations. Um, and for my way is that generosity um, should be matched with generosity. And so I was like, wow, that's awfully generous. How can I help to ensure that my community is a part of your survey? How can I help with recruitment? And so Nate said, can you help us by going to um, to, to help uh, go to the various pride events and help us recruit indigenous people. So I was like, absolutely. So that summer, I went to six different pride celebrations. I had rainbows coming out of my cuticles. I had so much pride. But I wrote, like just to talk about another story is, is that Travis and I, uh, we went to Winnipeg Pride and uh, pride, Winnipeg Pride was on Sunday, but on Saturday, they had some pre-events and one of them was a powwow. And um, so I went to the powwow, I danced, Travis danced um, mm -hmm. also. Uh, and I also went to full regalia because it was a powwow. And I would go around the tent and I would do our pre-qual of like, hi, um, are you GBMSN and or Two-Spirit? Do you have sex with men? Are you over the age of 16? And do you, are you a resident of Canada? That's our, and then um, they would say yes. Then I would say, hey, would you like to partake in a survey? I would say about 95% of the people who I got through the pre-call said no, that they didn't want to take in a survey. And I was like, I gave the strongest argument. I didn't give the best argument. So I must be like, and my argument had about 15 seconds to respond. And I, all I said was, oh, that's cool. But may I ask a question? And they were like, sure. And I was like, if only gay white men take the survey and partake in the survey, um, what will happen? And I never had to answer the question because the community members were like, oh, this is a bigger thing than me. Then I would walk from the powwow tent over to where the research was happening across this little field. And I would thank the people, explain the two different components because there was dry blood spot. When I would make it over to the table, I would say, introduce them like, like Jesse, thank you very much. This is Travis. Travis would immediately extend a hand and there was a handshake. And then Travis, because relationship is so important, Travis would take like three minutes or maybe four minutes of like saying, are you enjoying the powwow? How was your pride celebration? Um, and it was that attentiveness to relationship, that how, that little exchange, then the research would happen. And, and so I think that there is getting the method and or this, you know, your survey instrument through the tool of how do you collect two spirit, but then it is how is, the rest of the survey instrument, is it inclusive? To who's doing outreach and how does that outreach happen? And then that mindfulness of, of um, research beginning with a handshake that Travis so beautifully modeled and then got into these beautiful spaces of these amazing conversations with the various research participants, community members, mm -hmm. um, that only just added to the breadth of the research. So this getting the question is cool, but it's there's more to it that CBRC does do. They have an amazing model. Um, how we say a formal thank you in Cree is Informally, we would just say hi hi, um, and then the closest the expression, closest thing that we have to say goodbye is this expression examaga which means um, until then. Jesse? You. Sir? Say your word. <laughs> uh, so in MIT, uh, uh, the form of kind of all our relations or and a, a thank you is uh, Mishko. Um, so that is just a, a thank you for everybody. Thank you to Travis and Harlan for joining us today. Um, and now we can get into some questions. Um, if anybody has any questions, um, one of the uh, comments, I don't know, Harlan, if you are able to speak to this or Travis, um, somebody said, uh, it's a bit tricky when you're two spirit, but also let's say Navajo, your nation uh, may not be within Canadian borders. And so eligibility for prep coverage, uh, et cetera, um, 
uh, is difficult. This uh, will impact the data you're collecting from Navajo and other Two-Spirit folks alongside uh, Northern Inuk folks and such. Sure. Um, so for the from our, our Dene brothers and sisters, um, and this again goes into the awkwardness around Two Spirit. In that for our um, Athabascan rooted languages, as well as our Dene languages, is that when you translate Two Spirit into Arapaho or another Athabascan language, or you um, translate it into Dene, is um, it means um, it translate two spirit translates into you have a living spirit and a dead spirit, and that reality um, is um, it's an impossibility, um, and it actually is very negative and it is counterintuitive to their entire belief system that you cannot have a two spirits, a living and a dead spirit, dwelling as one. Uh, so it, it also translates roughly into uh, someone who's mentally unstable. And so for our Dene brothers and sisters, is um, it, it would be an insult to call them two-spirit or to say that they're two-spirit. And so when you meet someone who is indigenous and LGBTQI, you cannot make the assumption of one, they know what two-spirit is, two, that they actually use the term. So for our Dene brothers and sisters, it's Nale. And so I also will always work, like, can I use Two-Spirit or should I use Nadle? Um, when you look to the community for direction. As for PrEP services and PrEP coverage, um, here within Canada, uh, PrEP is available through, for First Nations and Inuit people that live outside of BC through uh, the federal non-insured health benefits. For our American brothers and sisters, there's many, many state programs that you can tap into. Um, for this individual who asked the question, if they're US based, talk to me and I would be more than happy. I have a two spirit um, and indigenous uh, prep training on how to access prep, what is prep, and then what are the various programs to get people into prep for our US uh, based uh, two spirit relatives. So please, I have some resources for you. And we also have some resources that Jesse will be working on here within BC. And CBRC does have other resources for First Nations and Inuit people that live outside of British Columbia. Um, so another question that came up uh, was, have you explored the role of experiences of child welfare services on Two-Spirit Folks Lives? That's a really good question. I don't think we ever asked a question within, I know that there is some anecdotal there is data out there, there is some research around for indigenous people, um, but I don't know, I, I know that Dr. Karina Walters has done some out of the University of Washington, there is some scholarship, I don't know how Two-Spirit specific it is. Well, I, I, I don't, I, I'm not aware of any research that that we, that Sex Now or CBRC have done. But, um, you know, what Harlan shared earlier, I think is a really um, nice reflection of how CBRC and the Sex Now survey work. Uh, it's, it's, it's really an open, collaborative, community-driven platform. And so I, um, I can't see from here who's asked the question, but I would suggest, you know, reach out to Nathan, reach out to Harlan and me, reach out to other folks involved with Sex Now, um, and present your suggestions for how we can incorporate this into future surveys. Um, I think tomorrow Nathan's going to be talking about the Sex Now uh, kind of research platform, um, and it's really evolved to be very um, flexible uh, with content changing uh, really uh, year by year, if not month by month. So I uh, definitely encourage you to reach out to folks at CBRC with your ideas. Um, another question is, are we able to share the slide with the survey question? So absolutely, as well as the survey question um, is in the Meet the Methods uh, two-pager as well that we will um, post in the chat. Um, um, some folks are just chatting about uh, Alberta producing um, from the Office of Child, Child and Youth Education. They did produce some LGBT data um, that was released last year. But um, question for Harlan, can you say again the Cree word for male assigned to spirit purple uh, peoples, please? Sure, it is uh, a Yaque, but there are other in the database. And so uh, please, I'll drop my email. If you send me um, your if you send me an email to my BCCDC account, I'll copy and I'll paste all of the translations uh, for both male assigned and female assigned. Um, 
that I have from the database. That entry was validated by 21 primary uh, Cree speakers. So it's a nice clean entry. Um, yeah, so there's multiple ways. And then you can also just reach out to me for a pronunciation guide. I am dropping really quickly into the chat, the um, meet the methods, uh, the two pager that gives the example. So there you go. Beautiful. Uh, are there any other questions coming in? Anybody have any other questions for us? So we may finish up a little bit early. Any final words? Travis? Travis, what's your experience with the Two-Spirit Dry Lab? Oh, <laughs> well, there was actually a question. How has the Two-Spirit Dry Lab managed the tensions between grants, uh, grants, preferences, and linear processes, and the research more on human approach to research? <laughs> 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 um, that's a great question. We, um, I would say we've kind of taken a two-prong approach um, and it's really, uh, in my mind, fits well with the concept of two-eyed seeing. So um, I'll let Harlan speak a little bit to like kind of how he's worked within CIHR um, to kind of push on systems. And I should say it's not just CIHR. Uh, here at BC CDC, uh, other funding bod bodies, we, we've had conversations about how the research process um, that was developed in a very linear Western fashion, uh, state your hypothesis, collect your data, publish your results, move on to the next, doesn't work for the kind of research we're talking about. But I'll just say from a Western perspective, we've acknowledged that uh, we do need funding to keep things moving. And we have basically tried to um, Speak the, speak the speak that you need to speak to get um, funding um, while keeping really uh, in mind the, the research process that needs to happen uh, from a community perspective, um, which is relationship driven, um, which is different from what I think a typical, um, you know, tri-council uh, research grant would look like. Um, so I think, you know, some of it is you have to continue to push forward and, and make do with where there are resources available to us. And that is really in line with, with our approach, bring, bring all of our strengths to the table. But also, yeah, I'd like Harlan to speak a little bit to some of the advocacy and activism um, that, that he's done, that we have done in going back to these funders and saying, look, there's some things you can do to make the research process fit better for indigenous ways of research and, and community driven ways of research. So um, from, um, when the, I got um, an invitation to apply, um, and then I got the actual invitation to be an advisory board member for the Institute for Gender and Health. So CIHR, a part of the Tri-Council uh, funding, and it provides the research money. Uh, there's also SHRC for social sciences, and then there's NSERC. So CIHR is the hard scientist, science. Um, there are 13 participating institutes within CIHR. So the Institute for Health, Gender and Health is but one. There's also an Indigenous Peoples uh, Research Institute, which Carrie Barassa is the scientific director of. Carrie advanced my name, and rather than appointing me to the Indigenous Peoples Research Institute, um, Carrie was like, this is a two-spirit scholar, a two-spirit researcher. Why don't we match him with the, um, the Institute for Gender and Health? And so I was invited, I applied, and then I got an advisory board position for the Institute for Gender and Health. A part of that conversation and, and um, a commitment for CIHR to embrace truth and reconciliation and by taking funding dollars and diverting it to uh, and prioritizing indigenous research, the Institute for Gender and Health teamed up with population, the Institute for Popul Population and Public Health. And they also teamed up with the Institute for Gen uh, Indigenous People's Health. And they pooled together a whack of cash. And um, they, um, they developed this, uh, it's called the Indigenous Wellness, uh, Gender Wellness Initiative. <clears throat> and so this research money and this initiative was to, um, to support the intersection between gender research or SGBA research, sex and gender-based analysis research and in Indigenous research. 
And then what they did was I was also on the advisory board for that initiative of like, how does that happen? And um, what we did was we put out a call of like, apply to attend this meeting in Montreal last summer or two summers ago. And, um, and you made your up application, you were either a thought leader or a thought supporter. So a thought leader was like someone like um, myself who was a member of the Two-Spirit Dry Lab. And we have a framework already of this is what we wanna research and this is what we wanna think about. Um, and then thought, uh, thought promoters were just there. And then we got into these little affinity groups, and that's where I met Jesse, is thought leaders would present their ideas of this is what I would like to do and concentrate on. And then other people would be like, hey, like Jesse goes like, hey, I like the Two-Spirit Dry Lab. Can I learn more about it? What is going on? And so we were then making these little research teams there. So rather than CIHR just like sending out a, a, a research call, and like Jesse submitting an application and Travis submitting an application and I'm blind to their application and I'm submitting and we could be working on the same thing. Why don't we pool our resources? And then uh, you had to be a part of a, that meeting in, um, in Montreal to then have a research member attend that meeting and then you submitted an application and we submitted an application to support the work of the Two-Spirit Dry Lab. Also, it was a one-year funding to lay the foundation for a, a, a much larger CIHR grant. And so um, what they did was it was a non-outcome-based um, proposal. So what we did was we want to develop a model. We want to work with a community, a two-spirit community-based organization. We want to meet with them. We want to see what are their research needs to support their work. And then we can come back as a Two-Spirit Dry Lab, look at what we can do with the 2018-2019 uh, survey sample, can go back. And what we would also do is however they asked us for the information, they may want a report, they want maybe an infographic, they may want a PowerPoint, however, or they maybe want an oral story. However they want that research conveyed back to them, then we would go back, convey that information to them. They then can use that to further their, uh, their work however that looks like. And then we would take whatever we work we did is then we would start looking for um, an actual journal submission for a peer-based, uh, sorry, a peer-reviewed uh, journal article. The work comes from community, we do the work, but it's a win-win situation. We get a publication, hopefully, but they ultimately get the information to further their work. And so, we can write the grants of this is what we want to do, but we actually don't know what the outcomes are because we haven't met with the community for them to tell us what are their needs and how can we as researchers support their work. So that again, that how is so incredibly important and CIHR had to their credit, uh, they have these process based grants, not outcome driven grants that really disadvantage relationships where we as researchers were like, we're gonna count purple widgets. <laughs> Yet the community was like, what are purple widgets? And that's not gonna help us. We need to know how many green widgets there are. And so we reverse that conversation of like, let's meet the community and let's really find out what did they want and how best can we support them to be better. So thank you, CIHR. Um, and thanks to the Two Spirit Dry Lab for that different way of working. Thank you, Harlan. Uh, so a couple more questions, and I think then we'll be out of time. Um, so one question was just about um, the Dry Lab. Uh, do uh, in the Dry Lab do we have partnerships um, outside of uh, itself with community? Um, do we do any consultation with community outside of ourselves? And what does that look like? Great, great question. Thanks for that. Um, yes, in fact, the goal of the CHR grant that uh, Harlan mentioned is to actually start to broaden, in particular geographically broaden the network. Um, we've just started to, to lay the groundwork for that. Um, uh, COVID kind of threw a wrench into things, both in terms of funding and uh, our travel plans, um, but we are confident that we'll be back on track soon. Um, and we welcome suggestions for other people we should be working, reaching out to um, and, and how to make this work uh, in, in a kind of a COVID compliant way. Um, there is, yeah. hi Harlan, you want to talk about 
kind of the broader network? Well, I think there's a broader network. You know, um, we do have plans and obviously because of COVID and some other just silliness, the wackiness of COVID and the COVID hole. One mm -hmm. is, is that we want to partner with um, um, the Monita Mon Manitoba Two-Spirit Society and to do that model with them. Also, I want to make an explicit, <laughs> so funny, um, CIHR was like, um, they emailed me once and they were like, we have an additional supplementary grant. And we we're like, and I was like, I don't think we qualify. Two, they were like, second reminder, third reminder. And they were like, you have 24 hours to submit an app. Uh, we responded. Um, and so they gave us a little additional money that if you are indigenous, self-identified, we're not culture cops. If you are a self-identified indigenous person, and you want to do some research, know that we have a little bit of money to support you to come and help us to, um, to do that work of the Two-Spirit Dry Lab. And if you know of other Indigenous people that maybe are in, they don't have to be in school, they just have to have the curiosity and they want to do research and they want to do quantitative research. And you're like, what the heck is quantitative? Come and talk to us, we'll tell you. Um, we just want Two-Spirit people, and we do have a little bit of money to support the work of the Two-Spirit Dry Lab. So please help and get us the word out. And again, uh, we'll pop our um, email address into the, um, the chat function. Um, and we will support and help you however you want to do to help. Uh, to, we have money to support you to come and do it, be a research assistant. That's it. Beautiful. Um, so I think maybe we have one more question, Marlon, if you... Um, if that's okay with you. So, um, so as you, uh, are there any nations that have words and gender frameworks which encapsulate non-binary genders, uh, fairly newly developed language in English to describe folks who identify completely outside the gender binary of masculine feminine? Uh, I notice a lot of the, this is from the, the participant, I notice a lot of the terms uh, are described as men behaving as women and women behaving as men, which still enforces a binary gender system. I'm curious how gender outside a binary system um, is acknowledged? Sure, that's a really, really good question. But you also have to uh, take into account um, that there, that English obscures and hides a lot of things. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in the beginning when I introduced myself and I was talking about Cree and I said, I'm not that whale, I'm not a man. Well, we actually don't have a term for man. We don't have that term that it translates into man. Nap whale roughly translates into the keeper of the fire. A squia, woman, which we would translate into woman, it, a squia means um, the carriers of water or the givers of life. So English is obscuring because we actually don't have a word that translates into man or into woman. It's about our roles within society. Carriers of fire, carriers of water, givers of water, givers of fire. And so I challenge that English obscures and hides that, that, and it looks like we are affirming the binary. It's just things that are lost in translation. So the words in which that for translation of two-spirit, they roughly refer to like half man, half woman. But again, that's problem. When we say like half a uh, napueo, half a square. So we're not actually using man, woman, but it translates into English. So English is just bad. It's, <laughs> The translation is bad. Um, half man, half woman, the negation, not man, not woman. And then there are these cool things that transcend all of that. Like if we look at um, um, uh, shoot, what is, I'm like drawing a blank, that there's like, oh, the changing one, Nadle. Nadle translates into for our Dene brothers and sisters, the changing one or forever, morphosing, like there is nothing solid, that they're always just changing. And so that's something that transcends in this non-binary. So just because the database says man or woman, like it does for the Cree translation, understand that we actually do not have a word for man and we do not have a word for woman. We translate it into that. So again, it's just things that are lost in translation. And I think what you have to do is really dig into the database and it's culturally specific but it also is looking at uh, a much more nuanced conversation around um, uh, the translation. Oh, there's also one other translation for the Chickasaw and Choctaw is, um, it says it's um, 
I left it blank that there is no translation. I have the translation. The translation is uh, when there's a medicine bag, it's a shoulder strap. Um, there is a stitch that takes one medicine bag strap that meets with the bot. And it is a stitch that is only used on a medicine bag for two spirit. That's the description of what a two spirit is. And so it's, it's not just a regular stitch. It's a stitch for a medicine bag, the two arms coming around they use that stitch there. That is something completely non-binary. <laughs> it is something that is like, like, it's a stitch on a medicine bag. And there's something power within that. So again, I really challenge these things around that it's binary or non-binary. It's seemingly, but it is much more complex. Uh, thank you so much, Harlan. Thank you everybody for joining us. I think that was a great summary to connect back to what Travis was saying earlier about working in the system uh, that we're currently in and how um, using certain language, unfortunately, in the current state, we um, that's how we're translating or that's how we're uh, using the language to further the two-spirit um, concept. So thank you everybody for joining us. Um, thank you to Travis and to Harlan. Um, and if you have any other questions, Harlan put the, uh, his email in there um, and you feel free to send him an email or contact me um, at CDRC.